Executive Vice President of the Owen Black Students Association. And on behalf of myself and the rest of the board, we'd really like to welcome you to this evening's event where we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Deloitte Global CIO, Mr. Larry Quinlan. Um, thank you all so much for joining us in celebration and recognition of Black History Month. And I'll now turn it over to Jane Johnson to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Thank you, Simone. Well, boy, uh, we're in for a treat tonight uh, because Larry Quinlan is uh, a bona fide rock star of the CIO world, um, one that I've heard a lot about over the years and just delighted to be able to meet, even if it's just on Zoom here today. And um, he's a rock star because he's been in that space a really long time um, at a really important firm um, for CIOs globally. And he is the global CIO for, uh, for Deloitte, um, has been at Deloitte for most of his career. Um, and in that role, he's responsible for all facets of technology, of strategy, applications, infrastructure, support, execution. And he spends a significant amount of time working with clients. I mean, I think one of the interesting things of being a CIO of a firm like Deloitte is uh, while CIOs sometimes are viewed as internal positions in a firm like Deloitte, it's a very external position too, because of course, uh, they're constantly advising their clients on state of the technology solutions. And Larry plays a big role in that. Um, also plays a role in Deloitte's own academy. And one of the things that we were chatting about before everybody got on board was the amazing facility that Deloitte has in, in Dallas where they bring uh, lots of clients through. And of course, anybody that joins Deloitte uh, spends some time at DU uh, to learn and to build culture and all those kinds of things. And I think everyone uh, in executive roles at Deloitte also manages clients. And um, you know, uh, certainly uh, Larry has a responsibility for some really important clients in the hospitality space. He's been at Deloitte since 1988 and served in lots of different management roles, including uh, working with US firms and uh, global firms. He was, uh, um, holds an MBA from Barack and um, uh, also a bachelor's of science degree from the University of West Indies. So we're really excited to have him here today. And of course, he also plays an important role of uh, dad to Kia. Uh, so we got, got to throw that in there. It's not just uh, uh, all work, um, great uh, connection to the Owen family. So welcome. Great, thank you so much. It's, it's really good to be here. You know, I do have to say that typically when I make a presentation, I have to be worried only about embarrassing myself and upsetting the team that puts all of this together. But now I have the added burden of making sure I, I, I leave in a good light because of, of Kia who's here. But, but as I tell everyone, I am indescribably proud of her. So hopefully she'll... <laughs> Uh, she'll manage after I'm done. So one of the questions I ponder a lot is how does a skinny black kid from an island of 35,000 people become the global CIO of the world's largest professional services firm? And I talked with that idea before I realized it was a really long title and maybe didn't adapt quite well to, to PowerPoint, but it's really given me a lot to think about. So we will come back to that. But you know, Deloitte withholds my paycheck unless I tell you a little bit about Deloitte. So you know, we are, as you know, the leading global provider of audit and assurance, consulting, financial services. You see the stats. And one of the reasons I like to put the stats up is because it shows my bias. My bias is a very large organization spread out across the world. So when I do what I do, I'm thinking about the regulatory environment in China and Russia and in the US public sector. I'm thinking about GDPR in the EU and thinking about all of these things. I'm also thinking about 300,000 people who roam the world uh, with devices and laptops and whoa, all that data that has to be protected uh, from all corners of the world. I'm thinking about the experience as it relates to people. But I do have to say that Deloitte is actually a really cool place 
just to be. And I don't hesitate to say that because of my experiences. I had a plan. I know they tell you all to have a plan. I had a written plan. I wanted to join professional services firm for two years and get the hell out. That was the goal. <laughs> all right. I joined Deloitte two years. And as I went through the organization, just realized the ability to make an impact in an environment like this was unparalleled. And here I am almost 32 years later. It's been an amazing experience culminating in the global CIO chair. And I think part of that is just the whole notion of people and what it means to us and the, that ethos the values that we espouse that you see in some of uh, some of the material here. But, but that's why I'm still here, because every day I wake up working with people I like on issues that matter with technologies that we care about for people who I think are the best in the world. And that sums up the whole notion of being CIO at Deloitte for me. So, you know, what's on my mind? Well, as CIO, there are lots of things on your mind. I, I'm sure you know what, what CIOs do, so I won't spend a tremendous amount of time boring you with all the details of the, the fun that CIOs have uh, every day. But I can sum it up in kind of one sentence, right? CIOs get blamed for a lot of stuff that they really aren't responsible for, but it comes as part of the gig. But let me tell you a few things that are on my mind. First, transforming the enterprise. I think it is a fundamental responsibility of executives today. And a CIO, the lead technology executive in the enterprise, how you transform an enterprise becomes a truly important part of how you operate. If you're simply going to deliver technology, if you're simply going to deliver cool stuff, if that's what you're going to do, then you're really a technologist, not a leader in the organization. And transforming the enterprise really means that we have to figure out how to make it more efficient, how to make it more profitable, how to ensure that we can create new markets, how to ensure that we can keep customers closer to us in a far stickier manner. And that's the notion of really ensuring that when we write the history of the organization, every few years, we are reinventing ourselves so that we're constantly leaders in our profession. And that's the goal. And technology today has a more, an increasingly important role to play in how that enterprise gets transformed. So it is number one on my mind continuing to transform the enterprise. But in order to have an enterprise to transform, you've got to protect the brand. And that is one of the sacred responsibilities of a technology leader, of a chief information officer. Today's attacks are breathtaking in their sophistication and mind numbing in their scale and intensity. We are attacked you know, hundreds of thousands of times a day in every corner of the world. And responding to how you protect millions of miles of borders with hundreds of thousands of people roaming the world is an, a truly, truly sacred element of our responsibilities. Without that approach to protecting the brand, you really tarnish the reputation of the organization, which reduces our effectiveness and our ability to transform the enterprise. But we also do cool stuff. You do have to create great technology experiences. You know, the dirty secrets of technology organizations is that for a very long time, we didn't have to build anything that excited you. We built stuff for the CFO. We built stuff for the CEO. We built stuff for general counsel. You just had to do what you were told. But there's a new generation in town. I can tell you from personal experience, they never do what they're told. <laughs> right? 
And the whole notion of people are simply going to use the technology because they were told to do so, that notion has been shattered. Now we really have to create technology that's easy to consume. We have to create technology that illuminates the business process that we're trying to enable. We have to create stuff that doesn't require tons and tons of training. You know, we have a saying in our technology organization that no rollout plan is complete unless it has a robust training component of that plan. And then you also have to recognize that nobody's actually going to show up for the training. Right? So within those two elements of your plan, you've got to figure out how to be successful. And creating a great technology experience is important. Uh, being, having technology that's intuitive is really important. But then divining the future is an essential element of what the CIO does. You've got to make bets. You've got to figure out which technologies are going to be important and when do you think they're going to be important. Everywhere I go, people talk about blockchain. Now, is blockchain going to be important in professional services or not? You've got to decide that. What about the future of mobility? What's the future of work? Everywhere I go, people say, are you going to be back in the office right after the pandemic? I say, I don't know. I've got to make a series of bets that if we're back in the office 80%, it works. If we're back in the office 20%, it works. I've got to play those odds, divine the future, and make sure that we are future-proofing the organization in a very important way. And making a difference in the community is key. And one would think, well, that's not the job of the CIO, right? Leave that to the corporate social responsibility officer. Wrong. I think it's all about you. Technology organizations are big employers of people. And we sit in communities. And we've got to make a difference in that community. So whether it's a hackathon in Nashville in conjunction with other leading employers there, or whether it's the work we do on our impact there at Deloitte when we put on our t-shirts and we spread across uh, the nation and in fact the world trying to make a difference in the lives of people, or it's skills-based volunteering, working with nonprofit organizations where we serve on boards, all of it is really important because we have to demonstrate to people that we care. Right? Nobody cares where we want to go unless they know we care about them. And that's a really important element. And then fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion is key. I believe it is my clear responsibility in the organization I lead to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for us, that means representation. So we unapologetically think about the number of Black people we have in the organization, the number of Hispanics, the number of women we're attracting to the organization, unapologetically. But we also think about equity in the talent life cycle. How are we doing with promotions and bonuses and compensation, et cetera? Are we doing the right things? Are we measuring it the right way? Again, unapologetically. But I also say, We've got to create an inclusive environment. We have to create an environment where every single person feels their aspirations can be met, where everybody feels that they've got a place, that their leader is looking out for them. Somebody's got their back, that they can trust us and trust the people they work with. And that's a significant discussion item for us set by you know, the tone at the top that fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to us. And underpinning all of this, the notion of enabling inspired people. Will we go above and beyond when no one's looking, when the leader's not in the room? Will we be intellectually curious? Will we deliver amazing technology, amazing transformation experiences? Will we protect the brand? Will we do all of those things? And those things come not from leaders smarter than everybody else making pronouncements from on high. They come from really enabling people who feel inspired to go above and beyond because of the inclusive environment, because of the aspirations that are being fulfilled, and because they believe in that mission. And that's what's on my mind as, as CIO. 
Now, there's technology woven into all of this. Of course, I think about moving to the cloud. Of course, I think about globalization. Of course, I think about where we're going with blockchain and mobility and, and Java and uh, all of these things get thought about. Of course, artificial intelligence and ethics and artificial intelligence and all the stuff you're studying in school. Of course, it's on my mind. But it's not what drives me because the technology changes every few years. I still remember X.25 networks. I'm sure none of you were alive when X.25 networks were in style. The technology just keeps changing, but the role of the leader doesn't. The essence of the role doesn't. The tool sets change from day to day, but that's what's on my mind. And there are a few things that excite me, all right? And the first one is really making a difference with people. And you've seen from the previous slide that, that the whole notion of people is the essence of the role. It's the essence of leadership in my mind. It's really about unshackling people, removing the impediments, trusting them, providing the kind of vision and clarity and really watching people grow and go to work and being constantly amazed at how effective people can be if you unshackle them, of how enthusiastic they can be if they feel supported and how quickly they will shut down if they feel like this is just not an environment that helps them fulfill their aspirations in life. But watching people grow, watching them succeed, watching them be promoted uh, in the organization is one of the things that truly excites me. The second is building the future. Always thinking about what do we have to be to do to be successful next year and the year after and the year after that is incredibly exciting for me. It's just putting in place those building blocks, those chess pieces that really allow you to say, if we do this, we can really turn that corner, we can really move the needle and, and we can succeed five years from now, 10 years from now, because we will have done the things today that allow us to make that happen. Right now, we're going through a massive exercise of globalizing our technology organization and really figuring out how to across 150 countries with 10,000 people in IT, how do we make the right decisions that still allow people to be inspired in Mongolia? And yes, we do have people in Mongolia, right? All the way to the United States and how to ensure that we can have the kind of culture that allows us to thrive in each of those environments believing that it is necessary to take advantage of that scale to really meet the demands of the future in areas like cybersecurity. And those kinds of moves, really figuring out how to make those strategic choices now that allow us to thrive in the future is, is really key. And the third is having fun. You know, you, uh, I don't know if they teach you this in school or not, but but work is, work is excruciatingly boring if you're not having fun. You know, I, I have said many times that college is kind of the best time of your life, right? Like when you're in middle school, you gotta do what your parents tell you to do well, most of the time, right? So you gotta do what your parents tell you to do and they pay for it. When you come to work, you don't have to do what your parents tell you to do, but you got to pay for it. You know, when you're in college, man, you do whatever the hell you want and your parents still have to pay for it. Like this is the greatest deal you will ever get. So I hope you're having fun now. But you will find the grind of work sometimes gets to you and having fun at work becomes important, which means having fun with your team, and having a good approach uh, to balance. And balance doesn't mean you knock off work at five o'clock every day. Balance doesn't mean I just don't work weekends because that's not what I do. You probably won't get ahead. 
But balance means finding an effective way of creating a level of choices in your life that you can exercise at different times. The way I say it is sometimes Deloitte wins, sometimes I win, <laughs> right? And sometimes, you know, we'll win together. And that means I might be doing a trip to Australia and I'll take off a few days to go diving uh, in Papua New Guinea, which is exactly what I've done, right? And there we win, uh, there we win together. But you know, spend time, don't forget to, don't forget to have fun. So there are a few things I've learned along the way that I just want to talk quickly about. So the first, communicating effectively. There's so many of us who have amazing ideas that don't get adopted or get adopted when someone else says them because we haven't put any effort into communicating those ideas. One of the things I'll tell you is whatever you are communicating to someone else, you already know. Therefore, by definition, you are not important in the equation. It is the person you're communicating with that is important because you were seeking to make a change in the behavior, the awareness, or the belief set of someone else. Therefore, how you communicate with them is truly important. But if you are going to gain followership, then you must communicate ideas effectively in a way that allows people to be inspired by those ideas and gives them the permission to follow, to join, to do more than they otherwise would have. So I would encourage you to really focus on communicating effectively, and it doesn't come naturally, it is practiced. I have practiced in front of the mirror at times on speeches that I will give. I have reworked, and the team will tell you this is true, we have reworked pages and bullet points on numerous occasions to figure out, does this sell with our audience? Who is the audience? Who's in that group? And how will it sell? But communicating effectively is an important element of this. Influencing others. We all want to be the boss. It turns out there's no such thing as the boss. Whoever works for you, there are lots of other people you're going to rely on who don't. And the whole notion of getting ahead by influencing people is important, which means you gotta be authentic. And I know everyone says that, but you've gotta meet people where they are, which means that people have to know that you actually care. Sometimes we listen to people just waiting for an opportunity to rebut them. We're just, we're just waiting to talk as opposed to listening. So we really got to listen. We have to figure out what did they just say? Sometimes we got to repeat it back. Did I get you right? Was that the objection? Let me talk about it. Let's see how we can negotiate this. People have to feel that you think they are worth listening to and influencing before they will be influenced. And we've seen as we've gone through the last few years, the polarization of society occurring. Well, you can let society polarize. You can't let your team pol be polarized. You've got to work together or you will accomplish very, very little. Then there's the notion of sponsors and mentors. So I, I get this a lot. You know, hi, my name is John. I'd like you to be my mentor. I'm frustrated with my current boss. And and generally, that's the opening for you know, mentorship or sponsorship. I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but I want to tell you that sponsors and mentors are truly, truly important. And I want to come back and talk about that in a minute. And then leadership. Leadership is very, very different from management. You will have to earn the title of leader. You will be granted the title of manager. But there's a quote that General Powell uses, leadership is the art of accomplishing more than the science of management says is possible. 
if you're managing a set of activities, you put it into a spreadsheet, you add up the hours, you know, it's going to take us four weeks to get it done. We're going to accomplish this. You get it done and you feel good about it. If you're a leader, you begin to think differently. What's my team like? How can we inspire them? What great ideas would this team have? I know the spreadsheet said it will take four weeks to get this result, but I'll bet with this team we have working together, inspired, that four weeks we could turn into three and get a better outcome doing it in a way that they never thought we would. Will we get a different answer with you leading? Will we get a different answer with you on the team? And that's really what leadership is about, as opposed to just the science of management. So let's come back to the question. How does a skinny black kid from an island of 35,000 people become the global CIO of the world's largest professional services firm? So let me tell you a story about how that happened. So I started off after graduate school in New York City, City University of New York, and um, never had the opportunity to attend Vanderbilt, but please don't hold that against me. So, you know, the placement office helped me get a job and uh, the job was selling paper. And I was kind of shocked at how much people selling paper could make uh, with an MBA. So, of course, I happily accepted the job and um, started looking forward to joining after a summer off. And as we got closer, I began to realize that I didn't love the notion of selling paper. There was nothing wrong with it, but as each day got closer, I realized I wasn't looking forward to going to work. And began to examine myself and realize that there are some things you love and some things you don't. The notion of selling in that format didn't excite me. The notion of selling paper in that format didn't excite me. And I thought about what I actually loved and I realized that technology was in my blood. And that's what I wanted to do. And I went out and I took some money that I had saved up for other purposes. And I bought my first computer, this Radio Shack uh, Tandy 1000 uh, computer. And I spent late hours at night working through it. And I came to the conclusion that I wasn't going to accept this role that I had already accepted, by the way. And of course, I went to the placement office and I told them I didn't think I could do it. And they will live it. If you ever accept a job from the placement office at your university and then change your mind, you are on a persona non grata list for the rest of your life, right? So of course they refused to help me and I had to pound the pavement in New York City for months. It was probably about four months. My family thought I was insane. Here was I giving up a well-paying job. Uh, to pound the pavement to find what I wanted. And I was pretty discouraged at the time. But I landed a job doing exactly what I wanted. It was a combination of technology and operations. And I was so excited to go to work every day. Oh, by the way, I was making just about 50, uh, 55% of what I would have made selling paper. And... I got up every morning and I was so excited and it taught me a lesson that in order to do a really good job at something, you need to be passionate about it. You either have to develop that passion or you need to be passionate about it. But I did that and it really, it really changed. So I went off into New Jersey and I worked for a couple of years in an organization, did well, and things changed. My leader changed. 
sort of lost faith in the direction of the organization. I'd actually achieved a fancy title. I was sort of the director of MIS at the time. It was a smaller organization, but you know, respected in the organization, et cetera. But I realized it was time to do something about my role. And I left, I took a risk. And I took a risk for an entry level position in a much larger firm, Tushras at the time, which had become Deloitte. And I took that risk because I realized that I had really maxed out where I was. And because I'd maxed out where I was, it was important to take a step back. You know, you fast, forward, you know, if you rewind, I'd taken a step back from a job paying a lot to stepping back to get the job I wanted. And now here I was taking another step back to become leaving director of MIS, which was my title, to become a systems analyst in a larger organization. But felt the risk was worth it. And the risk was worth it to me because when I interviewed, I found out something interesting that they were trying to make a decision between mid-range processing uh, computing on a digital equipment corporation or, or distributed computing on networks. And I had specialized in networks in my role in New Jersey. So here it was sort of put your money where your mouth is. You're gonna join this organization and there's a risk. If they choose the wrong thing, I'm out of a job. If I can convince them to choose the right way, you know, there's a real path here. And I decided to take that risk. And here I am today, so you know they picked, <laughs> uh, they picked the right thing. But taking risks became important. But I got called into an office uh, shortly after and said, look, we like you, got good news and bad. And I say, what's the good news? Well, two Schwass, we're merging with Deloitte Haskins and Sells, and we're going to be the third largest professional services firm in the United States. And uh, we like you, and we've got a role for you. What's the bad news? You'll appreciate this. Well, we're moving our IT organization from New York City to Hermitage, Tennessee. And uh, to me, like, uh, A, I don't know where Hermitage, Tennessee is. And B, there's an unwritten rule that people who live in New York City don't move to Hermitage, Tennessee. So I said, no. And the next day, a mentor of mine, a sponsor of mine, really, I didn't know the terms then, called me into his office. And I could see him now, silver here, puffing a pipe. You could puff a pipe in the office in those days. He said, I really want you to think about this. I'm like, no, I can't do that. I can't move to Tennessee. I don't know anybody in Tennessee. I, I don't like country music. I, you know, I just, I, I live in New York. Can't do it. There's no Caribbean food in Tennessee. <laughs> and he came back and he said, you know, you really ought to consider it. It's a leadership role and think about it. And then I came up with what I thought was, you know, the end of the argument. I just bought a condo in, uh, in New York. The market's bad, it's underwater, I can't, I can't go. Came back the next day and he said, talk to the CFO, we can work this out. At which point I just gave up. Next thing I knew I was house hunting in, <laughs> in Hermitage, Tennessee. Good news is I was able to build like a four bedroom house in Hermitage, Tennessee for less than the price of a one and a half bedroom condo in, uh, in Riverdale, New York. But this was the case of a sponsor helping me when I didn't know enough to ask for help. So a few years later, again, decided I wanted to go back to New York and resigned. And instead of throwing a party for me, you know, my, uh, my boss said, well, what would you like to do if you stayed? By the way, I had already accepted a job offer in New York. You're seeing a trend here uh, with another organization. And he said, well, what would you want to do if you stayed? And I actually took him seriously. And I went and I wrote a memo about it. I don't think he expected a memo. 
And a few days later, he had me in front of an executive at Deloitte who read that memo and said, yep, we want you to do this. And within a week, they had it all settled. And I was so impressed with what they had done that I actually called the company in New York that I had accepted an offer to go back to New York and told them I wasn't coming. This is the second time in my young career that I've accepted an offer and not, uh, not shown up. This is bad. Right? <laughs> but I was so impressed with the organization that I did that. And that was me being helped by a sponsor, one that I had gone in to resign. And next thing I knew, I was in a job that I love because he felt his job was to help me succeed. So I became the CIO at, uh, at Deloitte Consulting in the US, moved on to take on a global consulting role, eventually became a partner in the organization again because a sponsor helped me do that. Sponsor felt that it was important uh, to demonstrate that people who had been successful in those roles could be rewarded uh, in the partnership and really helped me do that. And when it came time for the global CIO role, actually before that, I'll just tell you one other thing, and that is we decided some time ago that instead of spinning off our consulting organization of which I was the CIO, we would actually bring it back, which meant that my job had disappeared. So I actually, as you can tell, I had daughters to feed. So I was actually pounding the pavement, looking for a job when the CEO called me into his office and started interviewing me in essence. And I said, sounds like an interview, you know, what are you interviewing me for? And he asked me to become the CIO of the US operation. Now, why is that important? I did not have a real relationship with the CEO because I was in a different division completely. Yet here he was offering me the CIO job, a, a cabinet role when he did not know me. And he did that simply because people he trusted had come to him and said, you need to talk to this guy, Larry, he's out there and we need to get him in this spot. What people say about you when you're not in the room is truly important. And when the global CIO role became available, again, it was sponsors who helped me do that. So I'll, I'll go to the end and say, I wanna ask, you know, do we believe it's different for minorities? Do we believe it's different for a black man, woman, uh, Hispanic, uh, any minority? And in technology, women are minorities for sure. The answer is it is different. And I think it is important that you understand some of the differences. There are a number of people who come to me and say, Larry, I'm uncomfortable with the notion that I am a black, pick your favorite programmer, technologist, manager. I am not. I don't want that help. I don't want, I don't want to check that box. I just want to be the best leader. I don't want to be the best woman leader don't want to associate with all of these trappings. And my answer to them is always a very brutal, you will not succeed. That this is a team sport and that you need help. And that very often we become trapped in this construct that we should do it on our own. And I see it every day with minorities and women in a way that I don't see it with others. Everyone else uses every connection they can. Everyone else uses every ounce of networking, mentoring, sponsorship, and everything that they can. But some of us walk around believing that we have to do it on our own for credibility. And what I'll tell you is it does not work. 
the way I got these roles and the reason I went through that storytelling for you is to demonstrate that at every pivotal point in my career, there was someone who helped me get there. Every big decision, every change, every job, there was someone who helped me get there. And some of those roles, they were people helping me get there when I wasn't in the room. They could have said anything they wanted. They could have helped anybody else. And I ask myself a lot, what kind of person do I need to be to be deserving of that help? Why did they help me and not someone else? And one of the things I'll say is you have to be willing to accept you can't be so proud that you think you want to do it on your own. You start in a hole and you're digging deep. It is also different for minorities in terms of perception. And I want to be brutally honest about it. Sometimes the, the expectations are different. I used to play a game. I once had a role where I had to travel across the country. And I would meet with leaders in the firm. And we'd be in these big, imposing boardrooms. And uh, I was new to the role, so many of uh, them didn't know me. I was meeting with senior partners in the locations and I would walk into the boardroom and people would just look at me with kind of stunned silence. I, well, surely you can't be that skinny black kid coming to tell us what to do. <laughs> and I'd play a game with myself. I have 60 seconds to get this crowd on my side. I could go in with a chip on my shoulder. I could, I could interpret the looks, et cetera. But to me, it was, uh, to me, it was a game. But it is different. Sometimes the expectations are different. And you've got to work to dispel those while at the same time managing to be your authentic self. You've got to decide what authentic self means. It means something different for, uh, for everybody. But it is different for minorities in roles like these, it is different as you work your way through the team. But with people helping, banding together in groups like you are now, it is absolutely possible to succeed. I firmly believe that. And I believe that because it's made such an impression upon me that I believe it is my, I am required to help others get there in my view. So I'll stop there and answer any questions you have. I'll admit that this is not the typical talk of a CIO. I will admit that you've learned very little technology from my discourse with you. I admit all that. But I can send you tons of reading material on any technology you want, and you can peruse it uh, at your convenience. But happy to take any questions that you might have. Awesome. Thank you so much for that great presentation. We're going to open it up to the audience um, to ask any questions that you may have. You could either call out or you can hit the reactions button to raise your hand and I will call on you. But to start us off, we have a first question from um, the club and it is how has the playing field changed for black professionals throughout your career? What progress or opportunities do you see now that were not available before? I do think the playing field has changed. It's not level by any means in my estimation. We still have a number of challenges as it relates to the talent life cycle, what I call it. And there's intervention required in ensuring that hiring is appropriate, that compensation is appropriate. What's changed, I think, is awareness of that. People don't just glibly say it's a level playing field or we hire the best candidates. I mean, some people still, still say that. There is, there is almost a sinister um, set of beliefs when people believe that if you hired more minorities or women into certain roles that somehow you, you explicitly lower standards. It is, it is difficult to come to terms with. I believe today more people are willing to come to terms with the notion and call people out on that. And that is, uh, that is very, very helpful. We're willing to 
think about representation in numeric terms. Whereas in prior years, you mentioned the word percentage and somebody shouted, quote it, and it just chilled the entire room. We're more open to having those conversations. We're more open to holding ourselves accountable. We're more open to finding talent wherever it exists, as opposed to only going to the same places we always have before. I think it's a great start, but there is no doubt that the, laying, the, the playing field is nowhere near level yet. When you look at the numbers, when you look at the techniques, and when you look at the end results, at leadership levels of the organization, it's not a level playing field yet. Thank you. And as a follow-up, you've had a long and distinguished career at Deloitte, um, and you touched on earlier a little bit more about your work-life balance or the common term work-life work alignment. Can you give us some tips to how you've been able to survive the stressful nature of working at a professional service fund for so long? You know, it's stressful. There's no doubt about it. And it's not about eliminating the stress for me. It's about acknowledging it. When I screw up, which I do regularly, there's still, there's still a knot in my stomach. My heart still races. I, I still feel stupid sometimes. <laughs> And the stress of performance is there and I, I don't try to get rid of it. I actually sometimes feel that if I didn't feel that way, then I shouldn't be in this role anymore. It means I don't care enough. And I, I do care and I care about our outcome. I care about our team. I care about our credibility, our performance and it creates a level of stress. But I try to ensure that that stress is embraced as opposed to it becomes debilitating. But I also believe in, in having fun. I, I believe in getting out there and going scuba diving, uh, scuba diving with sharks, which might be another form of stress, I, <laughs> I will admit. But, you know, it's so peaceful underwater and, and you know, the phone never rings uh, underwater, right? So that's one of the things. Um, boating. I've taken up boating in Miami. When I moved to Miami, I had a, sing, a simple goal, do not buy a boat. That was it. It was written down. It was like my plan written down, spent two years at Deloitte. Right? <laughs> um, I'm not good at these written plans, apparently. I ended up buying a boat, but it's a wonderful form of relaxation, I found, and a fantastic form of social distancing uh, as well. And that's been pretty cool to just deliberately do it. There's sometimes on a weekend, you know, you've got a hundred things to do and you take perverse pleasure in saying, hey, I'm going boating. I'm not doing any of these hundred things right now. I'm sure I'll figure out a way uh, to get them done. And since Kier is here, I'll also say, you know, we've had a long tradition of doing dads and daughters trips. We've done some wonderful trips. Uh, I remember going to Jordan and Israel a few years ago. We did Rwanda, uh, Gorillas in the Mist, and looking at genocide in Rwanda, and that was really cool. You know, stuff like that is it, it also kind of fulfills me for a very long time. Awesome. Thank you. Nimi, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, Larry. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, it's been great hearing your experience. Um, you mentioned having uh, turned down a couple opportunities um, to take other ones that kind of benefited your your idea of what it is that you wanted. How have you balanced, um, I, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, your selfish interests that, that made you feel better with uh, not burning bridges when navigating, um, you know, your career so far? Yeah, I, I don't think your interests are ever selfish unless they hurt people, right? So when it comes to professional development, it is the intersection of your interests 
in an organization you want to join that really make the difference and therefore it is not selfish in my mind. The definition of, of success, of, of fulfilling aspirations has to do with that alignment of what you need and where an organization is going. If that organization is not going in a place that you need, you just won't be successful and you won't be able to contribute effectively to that organization. So I would encourage you never to think about it as me versus the organization, but just think about it as an alignment. So when I made the decision not to go and sell paper, I recognized that I put that employer in a tough spot and I recognize that it put my school in a bit of a tough spot and it required a week of agonizing to be able to make that decision. I regret accepting the job in the first place, but I do not regret rescinding my acceptance. The reason is as I got closer, I realized that I could never have fulfilled my aspirations and I could never have been an outstanding employee of that organization. And that slot needed to go to someone who could be an outstanding employee of that organization. The way I got there was a bit roundabout, but in the end, I don't regret it. I think it's a win-win situation for the organization. The second one was, was worse, I think. If, I didn't have enough faith in Deloitte, and I should have. I should have talked about my desire to leave. I should have consulted with mentors and sponsors about going back to New York. I should have explored other opportunities, and I wouldn't have put myself and the organization in that position. So that one was, was on me. And one of the things I learned, which is why I made some of the comments I made about you need help is that I was young and proud and a minority. And I always felt that I needed to look good. So you wouldn't take the help, you wouldn't ask for it, you wouldn't, you want it to be private. You wouldn't tell people what's on your mind. You wouldn't, they wouldn't have a clue that you were thinking about going back to New York because it all had to be private until it was perfect. If I had trusted people more, if I had built a, the kind of network that I could rely on, I would have gotten better advice and I wouldn't have put myself in that position. Thank you. Professor Rango. Hey, hi, Larry. My name is Ranga. I'm a faculty member here. And Kia is one of my students. And assuming she shows up in class tomorrow, <laughs> uh, I plan to tell the students that you're almost as cool as Kia, OK? <laughs> uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, my question to you is, I think you've started addressing it already, but what aspects of the minority experience do you think was especially not talked about when you were at the business school? Or more specifically, if people like me teaching courses to students around leadership and effectiveness, what aspects of the minority experience do you think that we should especially make sure that we bring up in the classroom? Thank you. I remember I'm old, so when I did my MBA, we didn't talk about minority experience at all, right? <laughs> uh, but I, I do think it's important to, to talk about a number of elements of it. Uh, one element of it is we grow up thinking that our work is going to speak for itself, that hard work gets you there. And the fact of the matter is, it's just a prerequisite. The whole no notion of performance, image, and exposure are important elements that are intertwined. And the exposure you get is different at times when you're a minority because the sponsors you have are sometimes different. So the whole notion of ensuring exposure and seeking exposure there were times that being a minority creates a crisis of confidence. No one wants to say that out loud, but it does. When you're always the only one in the room, when you're overlooked at times, when you know that you were more qualified than someone else, when all of these things happen, 
it does create a bit of a crisis of confidence. And virtually every minority at some point doubts themselves. At this stage of my career, I still doubt myself at times. I always have to come back, of course I can do it, <laughs> right? Because when you look around, you don't see a lot of role models doing it. Why would you think you can, right? It requires this leap of faith to say, yes, I know everyone else doing it doesn't look like me, but I can do it anyway. And I think there's this notion of ensuring that you reach out for help that you avoid that prolonged crisis of confidence, that you build the strong networks, that all of this is important, that you seek exposure, not assume that your work will just speak for itself, that you have to speak for yourself. That sometimes our parents taught us that speaking up was boastful and we shouldn't do it. Now we shouldn't speak up in a boastful way, but we should speak up and we should tell our story because we can't always rely on others to tell the story for us. I think there's some of these intangibles that have to be discussed as we prepare people for the workplace and not leave them with the assumption that it's all going to be the same. In technology, we have a challenge there are times when we run technology as if women do not exist. It's a harsh thing to say, but we have to, we, we reward decision-making in a certain linear fashion that's male dominated, right? We reward people who behave in certain ways, even when the outcome isn't as good. And I think we have to discuss those things openly if we're ever going to change when we recognize that, yeah, it is different. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Do we have any further questions? Well, on behalf of the Owen Black Students Association and the Owen Graduate School of Management, we would like to thank you so much for your time today and presenting to us. It was really informative and insightful. Round of applause. <laughs> no, truly my pleasure. Thank you very much. Great. Well, have fun. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you.